Are cameras off? Yeah. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. We're thrilled you're joining us. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. I love this crowd. This is great. When you get a chance, can you please uh, can you please chat in in the chat box where you uh, uh, your name and where you're um, watching us from? Oh, wonderful. Indonesia, Los Angeles, New Mexico, wonderful. Oh, in Spain too. Charlottesville. Welcome, welcome. Well, I am absolutely thrilled that you're all joining us this evening for applying to Harvard Divinity School at mid-career. Um, my name is Margaret Okada Shek. I'm gonna, um, so the way today is gonna go is um, I'm going to give you a short 10 minute presentation, just giving you a little bit of an overview of Harvard Divinity School and our degree programs. And then we're gonna just dive straight into some questions. I have some prepared questions um, to ask our wonderful, wonderful panelists. Um, and then we'll open up the Q&A um, for folks in the audience. And then um, and we will promptly wrap this up um, right before six o'clock tonight. So we're really excited. Throughout the course of this, um, uh, this presentation, if you have questions, uh, please do feel free to chat them in the Q&A. So I am gonna just turn off my camera. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> well, welcome, thank you again. My name is Margaret Okada Shek. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions here at Harvard Divinity School. Um, so the first thing is uh, founded in 1816, Harvard Divinity School is the first divinity school in the US it, which is non-sectarian school of religious and theological studies and educates students both in the academic study of religion and in preparation for leadership in religious, governmental, and a wide range of service organizations. With more than 45 faith traditions represented in the student body, um, including those who are not religiously affiliated and 500 more, um, I'm sorry, uh, and more than 500 recurring worship services, HDS is also the most religiously pluralistic divinity school in the world. Our four degree programs lead to, uh, to infinite pathways with alumni in every single field and industry. So who's here? Um, on this uh, slide, you'll see our incoming class. Um, we brought in 96 MTS students last uh, this past fall and 51 MDiv, our Master of Divinity. Um, 12 of our uh, newest students are in our, our inaugural cohort of the Masters in Religion and Public Life. We have four special students and two in our Master of Theology program. Um, as I mentioned, our students are really coming from an incredible diversity of backgrounds. Our age range, I want to point out, is from 21 to 68. So folks in this audience who are, are probably going to be a little bit closer to the mid to upper range of that, that's what we expect. And I want to tell you that every single year we get folks who are really nervous and I'm always happy to share that like, yes, we do have students who are like you who may be thinking about considering graduate programs after having been working, after have been doing other things with their, with their lives and now feel like graduate school here at Harvard Divinity School is the right next step for them. I'd also like to point out that our students are coming from 121 undergraduate institutions. So that really just shows the diversity of academic preparation um, from our students who um, from around the country and around the world. 
We offer four degree programs. Um, our two-year Master of Theological Studies program, or MTS, offers broad study in religion with opportunities to concentrate in one of 18 areas of focus. Um, students enroll to prepare for a doctoral program in religion or related discipline, or to approach another field or profession such as law, journalism, public policy, education, arts, or medicine from a perspective that would be enriched by theological study. The three-year Master of Divinity program, or MDiv, is for 21st century spiritual leaders. Students learn the arts of ministry broadly conceived, including preaching, pastoral care, and community organizing, and link theory and practice with fieldwork placements in settings around the world. The Master of Theology program, or THM, is for applicants who already hold an MDiv and is designed to allow students to explore a topic in great depth or delve into a new topic that impacts their ministry, whatever that might look like. And finally, our newest program, the Master of Religion and Public Life, or MRPL, that enables experienced professionals in diverse fields to develop a deep understanding of the complex role that the religion plays in their work through coursework and a shared seminar with other professionals and a final project that deepens understanding of religion within their fields, leaders develop the religious literacy to effectively address critical challenges facing the world today. Um, HDS's Faculty of Divinity are among the most distinguished scholars of religion and practitioners of ministry in the world. With over 80 faculty and guest lecturers teaching more than close to 200 courses every year, our faculty includes some of the world's top scholars of Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and other traditions. So really, we, we have faculty and academic strength in five major religious traditions. Um, and what is really awesome, you know, one of the benefits of being here at HDS is not only do we offer outstanding faculty and academic resources here, which include six programs and centers, but it also enables students, particularly in the MTS and MDiv programs, to take up to 50% of their classes outside of Harvard Divinity School. So students are able to cross-register at Harvard Law School, Harvard Business School, Harvard Faculty, Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Harvard Graduate School of Education, and so on and so forth. So it is really safe to say that students are able to craft their or navigate their own um, journey through their degree programs and no two HDS students have the same transcript. The Office of Student Life supports over 35 student organizations every year and it's easy to start your own if that doesn't exist. The one that I'd like to point out for this group is the third chapter group, which is a group for students over 50 years old. These student organizations host all, all, the, all the variety of uh, uh, HDS student organizations have um, over 60 student led events each year. Um, and there are also two really important um, weekly um, events for our community, which include noon service every Wednesday at noon, which is hosted by a different group um, of students every, every week. And then community tea on Tuesday afternoons. Um, which is really a place for uh, students, faculty, and staff to just gather around, unplug, and really just build informal community. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about financial aid. Um, HDS offers really generous institutional grant aid for those interested in the MTS and MDiv programs. If you are interested in the Master in Religion of Public Life, the MRPL, or the THM, the Master of Theology, which these are our one-year programs, um, that does not offer institutional financial aid. However, you can apply for federal financial aid um, in the form of uh, loans, usually. However, if you're the institutional grant aid that we provide and we pool most of our resources for is for our two and three year degree programs, the MTS and MDiv program, uh, uh, programs. 90% of our app, uh, of students in those programs receive institutional grant aid, the vast majority of which is for need-based aid. Need-based aid is required for everybody. So if you are planning on applying, um, please submit a financial aid application. The worst thing that happens is that applicants uh, submit an application for admission and not one for financial aid and find they aren't able to afford to come. 
So it's really important that folks submit the financial aid application. Um, our, so we offer a small pool of merit aid, and that is based on the um, based on it's awarded based on the overall strength of the application. So there is nothing anybody has to do as an applicant. Um, we there really this is based on the strength of the application in the context of the entire pool. So the only thing you need to do is really just do your best to put forth as strong of an application for admission as possible, and you will automatically be considered for merit aid. Um, we offer really cool, uh, we had sessions on this earlier also, so I recommend that you check out our events page to check out all the previous recordings on both financial aid as well as our degree programs, if, as well as information on the application and how to apply. Um, so we have lots of different events on this. I recommend that you check it out. Um, just to let you all know our, our, our timeline, um, the application for admission for entrance in fall 2022 is now available. Um, the application deadline is January 6th for all of our programs. Um, this year, something new is that all students um, who will be admitted will be invited by an interview, and those interview invitations will be going out in late January to early, uh, late January to February. This is also the time where the financial aid application will be published. Um, um, and then everybody will receive admissions decisions by mid-March. And everybody who is admitted will receive their admissions and financial aid information. As long as you applied for financial aid, you will get a financial aid decision. And that happens within 24 hours of each other. So you'll get that all in mid-March. So, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us. Uh, we love uh, connecting with folks. If you wanna speak with a current HDS student, uh, please do uh, email the Ask Current Students account. Our HDS admissions blog is really awesome and it provides a ton of really good information. And our Instagram account, as if you're on social media, I think is really helpful in providing just some stories and just um, some ideas of what is going on on our campus and what what folks are what doing here. Uh, great. So I am absolutely. I'm going to invite my panelists uh, to turn on their videos now. Uh, and stop sharing. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am going to ask each one of our panelists, um, and I, I'll just like tell who, who goes first. It'll be James uh, first, to introduce themselves, uh, the degree program you're in, and where, where were you before you came here to HDS? Oh, James, I'm sorry, you're on mute. Thanks. James Lewis, I am a Masters of Divinity candidate uh, in my second year. Um, I actually came to um, HDS following a uh, about 30 year career as an attorney for the military, doing a lot of litigation. Um, and um, it was a, there was a third question or is that does that cover everything? It's good for right now. We're going to get to more in a minute. So the next I'm going to ask is John O'Connor. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is John O'Connor and I am a third year MDiv. Um, I've got one semester to go after I get through these finals and I have a concentration in early Christianity and Buddhism. And prior to coming to HDS, I too was a trial attorney for a period of time, but more recently for the last 30 years have been in uh, running a residential real estate business here in Boston, which I continue to do full time while going to school full time. So I think that says enough. Not something that I would recommend to the audience, just in general, or, or to anybody. John, I think, is a very unique individual in this world. <laughs> and then finally, uh, last but not least, is Lori. 
Yes, hello everybody. And I'm Laurie Sedgwick. I'm a third year MDiv. I uh, was not previously an attorney. Um, I um, actually left um, a, a career in administration at Cornell University. Um, I was there for about 20 years before coming here. And um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Look forward to answering questions. Okay, thanks so much. I guess, so I'm just gonna get straight into it. Um, you know, can you tell us what made you, dis you know, all of you are coming with such wonderful, rich experiences. Can you share with us as much as you're comfortable, how, what made you decide to make such big changes in this time in your life? Um, so we're gonna start with Lori first. Okay, well, um, in my previous job, um, I was a career advisor with um, MBA students and executive MBAs. And um, I knew about um, two or three years before I made this transition that I was ready for something new and ready for a change. And so I took advice that I would have given one of my coaches and um, did a lot of introspection and um, looked at my through lines in life and what, what were some things that I was attracted to and drawn to over my lifetime. And spirituality was, was definitely it. And um, so I started doing some exploring and I came across HDS and the programs here at the Divinity School. And there was just so much about um, HDS's particular program that drew me here. And um, of course, when I first thought about applying, I thought, oh my gosh, um, I'll never get in. That'll never happen for me. And then I gave myself the advice that I would give a coachee and that's to say, well, just apply and see what happens. And, um, and it seemed like once I started the process that somehow my... Um, um, my vision was aligned with the universe, and um, um, yeah, I felt like I had a tailwind from that point on, and um, and have continued to have that tailwind here now in my third year. So that's that's my story. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to switch to James. Would you mind sharing uh, what uh, what what made you come to HDS? Sure. So um, after a, uh, a long career as an attorney, uh, my wife is also an attorney. We were looking at continuing to practice law, but I've been ordained um, uh, some time ago, about 10 years ago. But I, of course, I didn't do it full time because I was a full time soldier slash lawyer. And the last four years helped me to recognize my, I follow the Christian faith. I practice as a Christian. Um, that there seems to be something lacking in Christianity. Um, as far as the way it's practiced. Um, my belief is Christians, we have kind of a mandate to love everybody. And yet uh, the last four years made it very clear that that wasn't necessarily being practiced. And so it seems that we need more foot soldiers, so to speak, um, uh, practicing um, and reminding uh, what love looks like. And so full-time vocational ministry seemed to be the path that I'm destined to take in some capacity, still working on that discernment piece. Um, but getting a degree, of course, is critical. And uh, my wife and I discussed where um, I should uh, pursue my MDiv, and Harvard was the number one choice. Thank you so much. And finally, John, would you mind sharing? Sure. My path to Harvard Divinity School is a little funny. When people ask me, I always say to them, have you ever had that inconvenient thought, I'd really like to have a puppy? And you hope that feeling goes away because you know having a puppy is going to be a lot of work. Well, that's how I felt about divinity school. And um, the thought just kept coming back again and again and again. And so I finally talked with my minister and I said, do you think I'm crazy to apply to Harvard and go to divinity school? And her answer was, honey, I've been waiting for years for you to ask me that question. What have you been waiting for? So... I started my exploration of Harvard by just taking a summer language class. And so I was a classics major like 35 years ago, and I decided I would take ancient Greek. 
And I took it in the summer and I wanted to test myself to see at my age, I'm 58, whether I was still up to doing graduate level work, whether I could continue working to pay for it, whether I would enjoy doing the work. These were all questions that I didn't have an answer to. And the answer was clearly, yes, I really loved it. I enjoyed it and I was having a great time. So I applied and then Harvard let me in and I decided to come. And it has been a great experience so far. I've really enjoyed it. Um, there have been so many great aspects to it, which I'm sure we'll get into the follow-up questions, but that was sort of my entree into Harvard Divinity School. Remember, puppies. Great. <clears throat> so what have been some positive aspects about coming to graduate school with more personal and professional experience? You know, particularly compared to many of your peers who are coming, um, who might be coming straight from undergrad or just a, a few years out. John, would you mind starting us off? The one word I would start with is perspective. I think that's one of the great advantages of being what I think we're called non-traditional students, but people who are coming in with a lifetime of experience in different careers, we have the ability to sort of put things in perspective. And I think, I enjoy school so much more now than I did when I was in my 20s in school. Um, I'm working just as hard, if not harder, but I'm not worried about it. I'm not up at night worrying about what am I gonna get for a grade? Am I gonna get into this class or this program? And I'm thoroughly enjoying just engaging in the learning experience and getting as much out of it as I possibly can. So I'd say that's the number one advantage, perspective. Thank you so much. Next, James, can I ask you that same question? What have been, what do you think are some uh, sort of positive aspects yeah, to I, grad school with more professional and personal experience? Sure, John is, is spot on with the perspective um, uh, item. That That's key. Um, Unlike John, I do worry about grades. Maybe I'm not as smart as John is, uh, but um, I do find that when I'm engaged in discussions in class, my life experience really informs the way I look at things. And I try not to uh, allow that to lock me into a position, but rather to give me another perspective that some of my younger um, classmates may not, uh, may not be able to have. That's great. And Lori? Gosh, I'm, I'm not sure I have much to add. I think, I think both John and James touched on the two key points. And that's one is the perspective of, um, I don't know, I think uh, approaching school with maybe less stress or, or having a perspective of um, being in a classroom and assignments and approach to assignments. Um, and then the perspective of um, our, our years in the world and bringing that to into the classroom and into the learnings, I think, um, for me anyway, has made the experience all that much richer, I think, yeah. Um, great. So on the flip side of that, what have been some unforeseen challenges of being an older student. Uh, so Laura, I'm gonna start you with, I'm gonna ask that to you first. Oh, holy smokes, yes. <laughs> I think um, for me anyway, it was being a student again and um, getting your classroom legs, I guess. And um, it, after having it, after it having been so long since I was in a classroom and having to read, um, the amount of reading was and, and remains very challenging um, for me, um, for sure. Um, and then learning to, to listen in an academic environment um, also um, was, was a learning curve for sure. Um, and then learning to study efficiently and um, my classmates and um, 
Um, certainly resources within the school were terrifically helpful with that, giving advice on, on how to study efficiently um, and then writing papers again. So um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's been a, a learning curve, um, but wonderful all the same. James, would you mind sharing with us what have been some challenges that you might have experienced? Yeah, um, studying and family. Um, I'll, I'll tackle the studying first and, and piggyback off what uh, Lori mentioned. As I've gotten older, it's not gotten easier to memorize things. And, you know, as we are in the Advent season, those of us who practice Christianity, you know, we talk about Ezekiel and Elizabeth, and the Bible says that they were very old. <laughs> well beyond their childbearing years. Uh, I, uh, you know, every time I read that now, I think that's how I feel in class every day. I look around and people are so young and they're fresh and they're memorizing stuff like that. I love the classes where I have to write papers because I, I do that all day long. But when you have to memorize things, I, I find I have to put a little bit more time and effort into that than I, than I used to. Um, and as far as family is concerned, um, my wife and I, as I mentioned, discussed uh, Harvard because I had an opportunity to attend Harvard uh, an undergrad, but I let that opportunity pass me by. And so she thought, and I agreed that this might be a good thing to do, but that's a challenge because my family's in Virginia. Um, as I mentioned, my wife is, is full-time employed. We also have a, a family that consists of uh, one more youngin who's 13, and also a special needs adult child who will always be with us. And so there's a trade-off that, you know, for every day that I spend enjoying Harvard, my wife uh, carries the full load, the full brunt of the, the load. But um, I would recommend that anyone who has that dynamic in their own life, that they make sure they have that conversation, that candid conversation about what life will look like, not just for you, but for those who you leave behind. That's some very wise words. And John? Well, in addition to everything that Lori and James have shared, I would add that there is a generational difference in us older students and younger students. And there's also a huge difference in the divinity school experience as compared to other professional schools, such as law school. And bringing that into the classroom and always being aware of it, I have found has been challenging and very critical. For instance, like in law school, we were all graded on a curve. And so a certain amount of people had to fail, a certain amount of people got the A's and everyone else was in the beginning, highly competitive, cutthroat. And this is the exact opposite. There is such a collaborative effort among the students and the staff and the administration. Everyone wants to see the students succeed. That is wonderful and it's refreshing and it's supportive. And with it, as an older student, I feel obliged to make sure that I'm not the white guy in the room talking. I'm not the one taking up all the space, the first one to put his hand up, the one to dominate discussion. And I've got to be especially sensitive to the fact that younger students are much more sensitive than I was at their age in school. And it can be very easy to offend people without even realizing that you're doing it. So I've had to make sure that I pay special attention to pronouns and gender identity and the discussion of sort of trigger warnings and launching into discussions that can be you know, graphic and moving. People are more sensitive these days than they were when I went to school. And that's a challenge and something that I always need to keep front of mind so that I am respectful of the other students of where they are in their educational and just overall development and life experience. Margaret, that, that deserves, I think, a foot stomp. Uh, that's an excellent... Uh, Thing to raise, John, because that's something that I didn't think about when I walked through the doors and looking around, seeing all those youngins, you know, was, was, was nice until <laughs> we began to speak and then the generational differences became very clear. Uh, and it didn't take long before I recognized the sensitivities with which people were entering into those classroom spaces and the landmines, the potential landmines that are just all around and tripwires. If you're not ultra sensitive to what's going on around you. And I love the point you made, and it's something that I think about every day, which is that when I walk into a classroom, just my 
age alone communicates something to the younger people who assume that I think I know it all. You know, I'm part of the generation that screwed it all up. That's how they look at me. And so when I come into those spaces, I make sure to, like you say, I kind of pull back a little bit and allow others to go forward. And what I found is sometimes my opinion is sought after, particularly when I make a point, it's succinct, it's on point, and then I shut up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we don't want to be seen as their parents. We, we don't want that to happen. We need to engage with them on the same level because that's where we are. We're on the same level as far as this education and this particular experience goes. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I, this is really illuminating. I think for me and for so many of our attendees and, and listeners in the audience uh, in the recording as well. Uh, <clears throat> the last question that I have prepared uh, is what, if anything, has surprised you about your experience at Harvard Divinity School so far? Uh, what has surprised you? So this time I am going to start with Lori. Uh, Lori, can you share what has surprised you? Gosh, I think the, the, the first answer that comes to mind is something that John had alluded to, and that is um, the sense of support and collaboration here within the community at HDS, that there, there really is a sense that people want to see you succeed. And I always remember being in orientation with Dean Hempton on the first day when he spoke to all the entering students. And one of the things that he said to me that just stays with me to this day is, and, and he says things with such conviction and, and are so heartfelt. And he said, you belong here. You belong here. And in those moments of self-doubt, I remind myself of him saying that, and um, and and that meant a lot. And and I think that that is really representative of the community here. Um, you know, people. If if you're struggling, um, there's there's people that can help you. There's resources, um, lots of resources. Um, so I think I think that sense of community surprised me um, in, in a very positive way. Um, certainly the, the brilliance and caliber of my classmates, oh my gosh. And, and I um, get so much and have learned so much from my classmates um, in a classroom, which has, with you know, their diversity and their um, perspectives um, has been such a, such a, um, rich, positive, adding element to the whole experience. And um, that's been really, really wonderful and was unexpected. Um, so I, I, th those are the two things that, that come to mind, yeah. Thank you. Uh, John, would you mind sharing? <clears throat> uh, three things that I'm surprised at. One is that, an easy one. I've learned to be such a better reader. Um, given the amount of reading that we have to do, I've become much better able to look at a text, to go through it, to pick up where it is, what its thesis is, its primary arguments, its conclusion. And it is astonishing how quickly you can move some through some of this. And that's a skill that you learn. I've been surprised that um, that I'm writing a thesis for my MDiv program. I'm Unitarian Universalist. I would not characterize myself as Christian. I was raised Catholic, never thought I would touch it again. And my thesis is offering my own translation from the original Greek for revelation into English with an introduction, commentary, and wild sci-fi art. And I never thought that that would be something I would be writing my thesis on. Um, and the third thing that I'm surprised at is that I've kind of rewired my brain. And I'm not saying that I did it, but I'm saying that being at Harvard Divinity has 
changed the lens through which I look at my life and the life that I'm leading in community with other people. I've gone from one of being sort of sort of self-centered navel gazing to one more attuned to um, service and help towards others. And it's come at me in very different types of classes, everything from New Testament to Buddhist sutras. And it's like, ooh, these are all sort of pointing at a life of sort of service and help to other people. And um, I didn't think that's what was going to happen to me. And it did. And I would say that is a huge success. Thanks so much, John. And finally, James, would you mind sharing what has surprised you so far about your experience? So um, you recall, uh, Margaret, before we, we began, uh, we were uh, talking about how wicked smart the kids are. Um, the kids are extremely smart. Uh, but here's what's surprising. I've been able to keep up with them. And, and part of it is what John referenced, which is we, we are forced to kind of rewire our brains uh, we're forced to figure out how to issue spot and, and and you know the volume of reading is so great everyone will tell you don't even try you can't read it all so you have to learn to to spot read um and the fact that i was able to do that really surprises me that it happened as fast as it did the other thing that surprised me is how how much uh, how pluralistic the school is i mean i i know i knew coming in that it, you know it's extremely pluralistic but the fact that it's celebrated as much as it is, is a surprise to me. I was raised a Baptist, ordained in a Baptist church. Um, I was married in an Episcopalian church and worshiped in an Episcopalian church with my family. Um, I am now in an ordination track in the United Methodist Church, and I'm doing a field ed experience in a Presbyterian church where I'm preaching. It's, and it's something that is not unusual. And I, I, I love it. I think it's wonderful. I think there should be more, more like it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we are going to now turn to the questions that have been chatted in um, by our um, by our attendees. So our first one, how have the HDS academic challenges workload compared to your previous academic experiences? What has been most challenging? So I guess um, I think that in particular, James and John had mentioned that they had gone to uh, law school. So aside from, I think you had mentioned the competitiveness, I'm curious as to like your experience of just having to manage being in an academic environment again and the pace of it as a full-time student. Um, James, would you mind starting us off? Yeah, um, this will be my fourth master's um, in addition oh. to my JD and my, and my bachelor degree. Um, my last degree, my last master's was a master of science back in 2015, which seems like a lifetime ago. Um, it's a lot, but it's doable. It's, it's quite doable. And um, I think that if you've been out of school for a decade or more, um, I wouldn't worry about it um, because others have climbed that hill as well and done extremely uh, great things, notwithstanding a lapse in, in education. Um, to compare what I'm doing in terms of the workload uh, with what I've done in previous programs, it, it most closely resembles my um, Juris Doctorate <laughs> experience, trying to uh, graduate from law school. That, that the volume of reading is, is akin to that. But I have to say, it's more enjoyable. John, would you mind uh, sharing your experience as well? Yeah, I would agree with James that the amount of material covered in divinity school is commensurate with law school. It's, it's obviously very different reading, but um, each challenging in its own way, requiring a certain specific type of attention. Um, it, it's, it's definitely doable. Um, I, I would say it's easier now than it was in my 20s, to be honest with you, because I'm more focused, I'm more disciplined, and yes, I can't memorize things like I used to, but I'm able to discern what I need to memorize now, which I wouldn't have picked up earlier when I was in my 20s. It's, I'm able to discern and bring perspective to things that I just couldn't do in my 20s that I can do now. 
And that has been a real savings grace in trying to allocate my time and my resources in getting everything done that needs to get done. I'm able to prioritize things easily um, compared to what I used to be able to do in my 20s. So it's definitely doable. It's a lot of work. I don't recommend that anyone do it with a full-time job like I do. That's crazy. Don't do that. I don't think anybody should either. Um, you know, <laughs> and uh, finally, Lori, I want to I want to hear about your experience. Can you share how has the sort of challenge of workload and sort of act, being back in the academic life? How do you manage that uh, based on your previous experiences? Well, I think um, for me, part of the key was um, seeking out help where it was available and and when I needed it, and whether it was um, getting help from classmates um, in terms of tips on how to read, tips on how to study, or getting together with classmates and talking about a particular topic and um, having having their support and hearing their opinions and sharing opinions and sharing perspectives. Um, so classmates, and then there are definitely um, learning resource resources available as well through Steph Gauchel, um, who can refer you out. And um, I know that there's a person who can help um, you organize and devise, devise plans for studying and reading and preparing. Um, so there are, there are lots of resources out there. And I think um, not, I have not been shy in taking advantage of those. So yeah, yeah. Um, so I have, uh, so there is a question in here of, you know, what do you hope to do with your degrees after you graduate? What are your goals? Um, if you don't mind, if, if it's okay also if you're not sure yet necessarily, that's also a valid answer to be clear. Uh, Lori, would you mind sharing? What are your postgraduate goals? Sure, absolutely. Well, um, in, in my prior role, um, I was career counseling and I was um, feeling called to um, work one on one primarily with people, but but um, have deeper conversations and conversations that were um, more on a spiritual level. And so um, I um, also have a background um, in the military as well and have a soft spot in my heart for veterans and um, could see myself um, potentially working with veterans after I finish my degree here um, or doing some kind of ministry, spiritual care and counseling in, in some venue um, when I finish my degree, so. Thank you, John. Sure. So after graduation in May, I will be doing a CPE, which is clinical pastoral education, which is hospital chaplaincy. I'll do that in the summer. And then I will do an internship uh, geared towards ordination in the Unitarian Universalist denomination. Uh, it'll either be a year or two years if it's part time. And I think it will probably be a prison chaplaincy. And ultimately, after that is concluded, I will then go on to ordination in the Unitarian Universalist faith. Thank you. And James. So I'm currently a, a licensed local pastor in the United Methodist Church in the ordination track for elder. Um, but I don't know that um, pulpit ministry is ultimately where I'm destined to be. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm still doing that discernment piece. Um, I know that at some point I need to lock arms with others who, like me, believe this country is well overdue for a revolution of love um, and working to see what that looks like. But uh, I like to be um, front and center um, in an engagement of that nature. Thank you. So there's actually two questions in this in, in the box just specifically for James, actually asking how do you do your commute or how do you bridge Virginia to, uh, to Cambridge? And, um, you know, do, do you feel like you're giving anything up also if you're having to go back home? So year one was wonderful. <laughs> year one was COVID. And so I was sitting right where you see me and it was wonderful. I was able, and my uh, special needs son who's still in school, 
uh, was also at home. And so I was his full-time caregiver and I would run downstairs to change him or to refresh him, give him food, whatever, and then back here to classes, et cetera. We're all back now uh, in our school slash uh, you know, work. Um, and now it's a little bit more challenging. And um, my wife and I recognize the investment required to be successful in this program. And so I don't come home every weekend. Um, I do come home on every holiday, every time there's a three day or um, I try to uh, have a schedule that enables me to not have to go to class on Fridays uh, because that frees me up to also do um, three days uh, every now and again, just because. Um, but the primary folks, the way we look at this is this is my job and I, I have to invest the time necessary to be successful. Um, and, but when I'm home, I'm home. Uh, and, and so when I do break away, their time, those are times when I unplug completely into family. Not always easy to do, but that's the tightrope that I walk. Um, thank you so much. So um, there's a someone here who's really curious about what kind of field work your, the panelists are doing um, and how you chose that. And how would that compare with the other types of professional experience you had before coming to HDS? Um, so Lori, would you mind starting us off on that one? Sure, absolutely. I am right now um, working as a seminarian with Harvard's Memorial Church. And um, I will be in that role for this year. And it has been such a joy. It's, it is probably a highlight of my experience um, so far. And um, I think it's, it's um, um, the element of leading morning prayers on um, a number of days a week with my fellow seminarian. Um, it's having delivered a morning prayers talk, which um, I was petrified about doing. Um, but, um, um, you know, have gotten used to um, standing at the Eagle lectern, as they say, um, being part of Sunday services. Um, and um, also we do a seminarian seminar um, once a week where we're meeting with um, the Reverend Matt Potts and we meet with um, the associate um, minister there, Alana. Um, Sullivan, and I've also gotten direct spiritual um, uh, theological reflection with um, Emmanuel Ekampong, who is one of the associate ministers at uh, Memorial Church as well. It's just been a really wonderful experience, and um, yeah, I feel very fortunate um, to be part of the Memorial Church this year, so that's been wonderful, yeah. And I'm assuming this is nothing like anything you did when you were working at Cornell, right? Oh my gosh, no, no. <laughs> Just to sort of answer that other part of the question yes. of like, yes. like, like jumping into the deep end of the pool. Yeah. Wonderful. John, would you mind sharing your field ed placements and uh, how you chose them? Sure. My field ed placements have been two of the highlights of my time at Harvard Divinity School. The first was last year when we were completely on Zoom, and I was one of the intern chaplains here at Harvard Divinity School. And it was a transformative experience because it allowed me to be involved with how are we going to create community for the incoming class? It was one thing for those who had been there, you could fill in the gaps because you actually knew what people looked like and who the professors were. But the question was, how do we create community out of whole cloth digitally? And so it was everything from helping to plan everything from the um, orientation through to graduation. And that experience allowed me to interact with all kinds of different student groups that we needed to interact with, go to faculty meetings, be on committee with faculty and students and staff. And it was a transformative experience. And it made my experience at Harvard Divinity School so much richer because it was so deep and so broad at the same time. The second one was I was a summer internship at a Unitarian Universalist congregation. So I ran their whole summer program in New England. We still have the lovely tradition where the minister gets the summer off. Uh, so I was stand in 
uh, and organized 12 services, preached to, um, arranged everything else for the other 12, for Zoom broadcasting, um, did pastoral care and counseling visits to uh, congregants, both at church and in the hospital. So those were two great experiences. I highly recommend uh, the field education experience. It's great. And the office is terrific in helping you create almost anything you want. Ed Jeans. My uh, first field ed experience was actually a six month uh, experience. It began in March and went through the summer um, as a, uh, an interim pastor in the United Methodist Church. It was an all white church and not a single congregant was under 60. Uh, and so it was interesting as we got to know, learn about one another. Um, uh, at the same time, because I don't have a UMC background, I was learning about UMC church polity um, and there was no one there to really hold my hand. The regularly assigned pastor uh, was out for, for medical reasons and wasn't able to be contacted. But it was a great experience uh, for all the reasons that have already been referenced, like doing pastoral care is I love uh, tending to the, the needs, uh, the spiritual needs of, of congregants. Um, and, and developed quite wonderful relationships with uh, the folks there. And of course, every Sunday and every Wednesday, I'm, I'm on a platform preaching. So that was a great experience. Um, this year, uh, my field ed experience is, as I mentioned, in a Presbyterian church. I have no experience with uh, Presbyterian churches. So I'm learning that church polity. Um, and I'm able to preach. Uh, I think there are four or five opportunities that I'll have. My first was actually this past Sunday. Uh, during the second week of Advent. Um, but I also get an have an opportunity to put together programs that will be beneficial to the, not just the church community, but the surrounding uh, neighborhood. It's at the end of the Methadone Mile in Boston. Uh, there are um, a lot of homeless individuals in South Boston. Um, many of them are addicted uh, they, to, to methamphetamines. And so we get a lot of that crowd that comes in um, for food or for other, other needs. And that's a wonderful ministry I've found. Um, a program that, that uh, I've just been given permission to start is called The Knack, because we have a knack as Christians for loving on people. And this is known and not alone in Christ's kingdom. Um, and it's really just giving a nod to the fact that people are isolated right now, um, still during this COVID time. We, we seem to be out of it. And then it's like uh, Pacino, just when I think we're getting out, they pull me back in. And so a lot of people um, don't have anyone to really engage with and they're not being heard They're not they're not uh, feeling connection. And so we're, we're organizing individuals to on a weekly basis, uh, maintain close contacts, at least half an hour of just letting people um, talk and, and share. Um, and I think that's going to be really wonderful for the uh, mental health of a lot of folks. And we're tied in also with psychiatrists who, if we find that there are some serious uh, needs that require um, professional care, uh, we can we can off-road, off-ramp that. So those are my two experiences. Thank you. So I'm going to do, there's three questions here that I kind of want to knock out together in sort of one, because they're all sort of... Um, they're all mentioning the same thing, basically. It's how do you make friends if your class, like, do you make friends with your classmates who are much younger than you? Do you hang out, especially if you are moving like uh, James and Lori have from a different state? James has family responsibilities also. So, you know, how do you make friends in this kind of environment? Do you hang, do you make friends in this kind of environment? And how does that happen? So I actually want to ask Lori first and then James particularly because you moved from elsewhere. John, I know, was in Boston. So folks in Boston might have their preset friends, but John, I'm not letting you off the hook because I want to know how you build community too. Uh, I, th I think all of us agree HDS is a pretty small place and every single individual is active contributing member of what makes this place so special. But I really want to hear from folks who are students. Uh, so, Lori, can you just share first? Sure. Um, well, I mean, you have such an important foundation in common, and that's why you're here. 
and in taking classes with one another and perspectives, um, that's what draws people together. And, and what, um, so, so in some ways in the classroom, yes, there is an age difference, but, but there is that commonality of, of the subject matter, which draws people together, I think. Um, so yes, I have friends here and, and it's been really wonderful. I think, you know, an eye-opening, um, I think um, seeing the perspective of my younger classmates as well and just learning from them. And yes, um, it, the first year, um, I know that John and I started, there was a, um, I think we were a pretty robust uh, third chapter group. And um, those were folks who um, were um, maybe a little more mature in, in life. And, um, and we met, um, I don't know, about once a month, maybe twice a month for breakfast, once a month. And, um, and that was a wonderful way to get together with folks um, that uh, were more in our age range and um, share experiences together. And, um, and yes, and, and I, I befriended uh, another classmate who um, we've been maybe somewhat inseparable, I guess, since um, those early days. And, um, and so, yes, yes, there's lots of opportunity to, uh, to make friends here and, and feel, yeah, feel a part of the community, yeah. Oops, James, would you mind sharing? Yeah, not at all. Um, you, how do you do it? It, it just it happens naturally, actually. Um, especially if you're, uh, you know, you have a personality that's such that you just love being around people and you love meeting people, and and, and I do. Um, some of my closest uh, friends are, are not Christian, for example. Um, the ones I gravitate toward, we all, in fact, we're, we're like a little clique. Uh, one of us is Christian, that's me. Uh, one is Buddhist, one is a Sikh, <laughs> one is a Jew, and the other is a Muslim. And we just, we just, we've gravitated to one another and we're, you know, we're thick as thieves, as they say. Um, I don't hang out because I just don't have the time to do it. Uh, and the time, because the time that I do have, I have to maximize uh, to afford uh, myself the opportunity to, to be with family. And John. Pardon the bell. I love having, I love clocks like that. I, I mean, I find them charming. Well, like James, I don't have time to hang out, but that does not mean I have not had an opportunity to make close friends at Harvard. And I would say that comes in two ways. One is the academic. Um, a lot of the classes that we take have what we call sections, which are small groups that uh, meet on a weekly basis to uh, discuss certain points in class. Uh, study groups will often form. I found that especially helpful for the memorization classes. Um, very helpful with those index cards, which are now all online. Who knew that? Um, and so, yeah, made a lot of friends that way. And then also there are the student groups that you might choose to become affiliated with. Like for me, it's the uh, Unitarian Universalist group. So there's about 20 of us in school and they have meetings every week and they have special little worship services that go for half an hour once a week. So there's ample opportunity, um, both on a social and an academic level to make meaningful relationships with your, with your fellow students. For sure, I wouldn't worry about it, even if you don't have time to hang out like James and me. Well, actually, that is a wonderful way to end this session. Uh, I want to say thank you so much to our participants for sharing their stories and their voices. And thank you to all of you in the audience for listening and for joining us this evening. Um, we hope that this is helpful to you. We will be offering other types of events. Um, I believe there's one left and then also the recordings are online. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email us. Thanks so much and have a great one. Bye-bye.